So uh, let's uh, review the aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework for understanding the macro economy and examine the effects, short run and long run, of a couple of policy changes. So briefly, to review, let's remember that uh, we have uh, our aggregate supply curve, upward sloping, uh, and that describes a relationship between inflation and GDP. Uh, the higher is GDP relative to the potential level of GDP, the higher will inflation be. So inflation is related to the output gap, which, again, by Oaken's law, is related to the unemployment gap, if we uh, think of there being a kind of natural rate of unemployment in the economy, people are leaving um, jobs and there's always some turnover as industries expand and contract, that's the natural rate of unemployment. If unemployment is higher than that natural rate, workers aren't uh, in positions to uh, to demand higher wages, and so inflation doesn't rise. If uh, unemployment is much lower than the natural rate, so that the labor market is very tight, workers are in good bargaining positions, then we see rises in wages that get translated into rises in prices. So that would be our standard motivation for thinking of this aggregate supply curve as being upward sloping. The original Phillips curve was, was clearly wrong, uh, and in the 1970s, we saw quite clearly why it was wrong. Uh, it was wrong for two reasons. One is that it didn't incorporate expectations of inflation, and the second is that it didn't incorporate price shocks. And so our uh, sort of improved uh, Phillips curve, aggregate supply curve, takes into account that inflation is also uh, determined uh, quite a bit by previous uh, expectations of inflation. So that's our... Uh, relationship then between GDP and inflation, and of course implicitly there we have unemployment. Then we have our aggregate demand curve. Our aggregate demand curve describes the relationship between uh, inflation and output. Uh, remember there's the whole uh, uh, multiplier effect going on underneath this, and the basic reason why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping is that higher uh, inflation means that the Fed uh, the central bank lowers the real interest rate because the central bank is mandated to uh, pursue policies that bring about price stability, which the Fed currently defines as an inflation rate of 2%. Um, so the Fed lowers the real interest rate. How does it do that? Well, it conducts open market operations. Um, it can tighten uh, the required reserve ratio. Uh, it can intervene in the uh, through open market operations and through its discount rate and through the interest rate on, on uh, reserves. Uh, it can affect the uh, federal funds rate, the overnight rate that banks lend to each other. They lend their, their reserves to each other. Uh, and that then, through arbitrage, affects the entire yield curve of, the, of interest rates in the economy. Um, so the Fed changes the real uh, interest rate. The real interest rate, in turn, affects investment, consumption, and net exports, uh, and uh, and those decline, and they're all components of aggregate demand. So aggregate demand declines, and and GDP uh, declines because GDP is determined by aggregate demand, and in, in our uh, kind of Keynesian model. So that's the the basic framework of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Um, model of the determinants of our main macroeconomic variables, interest rates, GDP, um, uh, inflation, and uh, unemployment. So, and the exchange rate. We'll, we haven't talked much about the exchange rate yet, but we will incorporate that. Let's, uh, let's think about some policy changes. So let's imagine we have some monetary easing. So remember, the Fed uh, we think about their policy, uh, describe it by this monetary policy curve, any given level of inflation, um, the Fed, uh, through its sort of longer-term monetary policy and its uh, lambda, which describes how it reacts to inflation, those determine the real interest rate, uh, the real interest rate policy that the Fed will have for, uh, for, for the short term, at least.
Um, so that's described by this MP curve, and when we talk about monetary easing, we mean that for any given level of inflation, the uh, Fed chooses a real interest rate that's lower. So R bar goes down, <clears throat> so the MP curve shifts, shifts downwards. Since we now have a lower real interest rate, we interpret that in our aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework as a shift to the right of the aggregate demand curve. Lower interest rate means more consumption, more investment, uh, and more net exports. So the aggregate demand curve shifts out to the right. Our, our short-term new equilibrium then is GDP above potential, so GDP rises, and inflation. So inflation goes above its uh, whatever maybe it was at two percent at its target, and now inflation is going to be is going to be higher, because GDP is above potential. Over the long run, we now have an output gap, a positive output gap. Labor market is tight, uh, and that feeds into then people's expectations of inflation for the next period, and so the aggregate supply curve shifts to the left and continues to shift to the left. Uh, until the economy is back at potential and we get a higher level of inflation at the end of the day. Uh, so monetary easing generates higher inflation with no long-term change in output because we return to our potential level of output. And that's, the, that's where now our kind of long-run Keynesian model uh, turns back into exactly the same as our, our classical model where money was neutral, where money was a veil, where money had no effect on the real uh, economy except in the, in the short term. Um, so let's uh, do one more policy change. Let's imagine we have a fiscal expansion and let's, uh, let's think about this fiscal expansion uh, in a context where uh, where we're below potential, so our GDP starts out here, and our potential level of GDP is here. So we're sort of in a in a recession, in a in a downturn. Um, so we represent the expansion, uh, increase in government spending, uh, whether it's uh, borrowed or, or or whether it's uh, uh, financed by raising taxes. Remember, the balanced budget multiplier was was positive, so GDP go up even with a balanced. Uh, budget increase in government spending and taxes. So we have an increase in, in uh, expansionary fiscal policy. GDP rises in the short run, as does inflation. Uh, so that would be our first effect that we would think about. But now, right, because uh, GDP is, um, uh, our new level of GDP is still below potential, um, so we have Y2. GDP is still below potential. So the aggregate supply curve shifts downwards. Uh, so the inflation consequences of the expansionary fiscal policy are, are maybe not so not so serious. And we end up here um, rather than, than up here. So with that, this would be uh, the actual level of inflation that we might uh, that we might have. So at that level of GDP, um, uh, because GDP is below potential, the uh, aggregate supply curve continues to shift uh, down and and keep shifting down until we're so we're at potential. So we see very little increase at the end of the day in inflation. Uh, so we might see a little bit of temporary increase in inflation. That is, inflation will be higher than it would have been otherwise. But uh, the inflation rate will still be coming down over time uh, in this uh, in this scenario, and we end up back at potential. So expansionary fiscal policy in a recession uh, would seem to have very few, in terms of our macroeconomic model, very few um, um, reasons not to be in favor of that. And uh, as an exercise, you should think about, well, if that's the case, why are so many uh, economists and policymakers opposed to uh, expansionary fiscal policy um, in, for example, Europe or in the United States now, when unemployment is still clearly quite higher than the than the natural rate.